Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Folta. I'm a chair elect of the STR division. And today we're uh, super honored to have Harbir Singh in our Meet the Scholar um, interview session. So uh, we have a few hours with Harbir, and uh, um, I'm excited for it. Um, I have a few questions I want to ask him with. I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, I think it works nicely if you uh, ask your own questions in the chat feature, and, and I may get to those, or I may call on you to, to ask uh, yourself uh, of Harpier uh, those questions. So uh, why don't we proceed? Uh, welcome. Uh, let's see. I want to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, so this is our session. Um, a little introduction here. Uh, Harbier is uh, at the Wharton School. He is the William and Phyllis Mack Professor of Management and co-director of the Mack Institute for Innovation, faculty director of the Huntsman Program. It'd be interesting, Harbier, to get your perspective on those organizations. Sure. Uh, PhD at, at the University of Michigan and uh, MBA in Indian Institute of Management. Uh, he was the VPS division chair uh, in 97 and 98. Um, amazingly, over 73,000 Google citations, 50, 50 publications in top journals, over 50. Uh, he's written two books geared towards practitioners uh, and those were highlighted today in SMS's announcement that Harbir is the winner of the 2020 C.K. Prahala Distinguished Scholar Practitioner Award. So uh, our interview is timely, Harbir, and you can see the list of names uh, that preceded uh, uh, him, and they're quite esteemed. Uh, he's been on lots, he served the division and the, the academy in lots of different ways, editorial boards, um, one of the key contributions, I think, and we're, we're going to get to it in our discussion today, is, is his role as advisor to so many PhD students, uh, successful PhD students. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Harbir is known for his research on corporate governance, uh, corporate strategy, joint ventures, management buyouts, acquisitions. Uh, so uh, we'll probe him a little bit uh, on some of those issues as we go forward. So without further ado, Harbir, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I think it's nice maybe to, to get to, to some personal stuff off the bat. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background, uh, uh, where you grew up, um, what, uh, what people pay, played a a pivotal role in your life and, and uh, what led you to a career in academics and um, were you doing any anything uh, else uh, professionally before you entered the doctoral program questions like that thanks thanks tim uh, thanks everyone for taking the time in uh, on a beautiful august day to listen to a scholar drone on and on about research uh, so i'm just delighted that you're you're you I don't know, we've actually not shown the best judgment, but, you know, we'll make the most of this time. <laughs> uh, but I, I uh, uh, Tim, very good question. We, we often don't think about where we came from and what brought us here. That's, I think, really important, particularly looking back now in this stage of my career. So I grew up in India. Um, my father was an engineer and actually built, uh, he was a civil engineer. He, he built the second largest dam in India. Uh, as, a, as a young executive engineer. And so I very much had the idea of engineering, analytics and so on. Uh, I ended up doing an undergrad in engineering, actually electrical engineering uh, and computer science. Uh, at that time it was, uh, I was in one of the leading engineering schools. It had a lot of uh, resources connected to uh, foreign institutions. Uh, so in my undergrad uh, sort of thesis, um, I, um, we had just bought, the institute had just bought a semiconductor diffusing chamber. And so for my thesis, I 
diffused a transistor uh, with you know from from using the masking and the optical camera and all of that and it was to calibrate the machine and uh, my i had a partner with me whose father was a professor and i kind of got interested in research i said this is really interesting to sort of calibrate something and write about its properties and all of that and of course somebody manufactures it somewhere else but then I, when I graduated, um, the job I got was um, from in a commercial organization, Philips, the Dutch multinational, uh, in the Indian operation, and they put me in marketing, and I was absolutely astounded that, you know, what do I know about marketing? And you know, I just diffused a transistor, and here I am trying to sell industrial lighting equipment uh, to bureaucrats. Uh, and uh, but then I learned a lot about what I didn't know about commercial activity. And so I decided to do an MBA um, and I went to the Indian Institute of Management, which Asim Kaul, who's here on this call, also went there and Asim is my former student as well. Um, and when I finished, I remember telling my friends, I'll, I'll, this is the last time I'll be in class, you know, I've done my master's, I'm ready to take on the world. And I joined a, a consumer marketing company and uh, I got a, a very fast track um, because they, they really wanted MBAs. And I realized that I was on the road and I realized that, you know, this is not very interesting. That uh, basically I'll end up, my epitaph will say he sold, you know, uh, 1 million yards of textiles. I'm not sure that's, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's motivating enough. It certainly was to many. Uh, but I didn't, wasn't that keen on it. And also I felt our decision-making process was very ad hoc and odd. So I decided to apply for a PhD saying, maybe I'll learn a bit more and applied to University of Michigan among others. And I applied actually in management science. And my essay was about decision-making under uncertainty and how people revert to heuristics. I didn't call it heuristics then, I called it thumb rules. And I wanted to know if people can use optimization better and hedging strategies better. So I ended up in Michigan doing a PhD in statistics and uh, ran into CK Pralad over there. And he said, what the hell are you doing theorems and proofs? And I said, no, I'm trying to pass my comprehensive exams. And he said, you realize you'll keep doing theorems and proofs for the rest of your life. And I was so clueless, I didn't realize that's what the job was about. I said, well, I better change my field. And I ended up in strategy. So that's the long answer to a short question. Okay, great. Um, and so after you changed, it was originally about dissertation under, un or not dissertation, about, uh, was it strategy under uncertainty or decision-making under, yeah, under uncertainty? Under uncertainty, Bayesian, Bayesian statistics and things like and that. And so how did it change? What was your dissertation about after you moved to so strategy? It became, so my first, I read a whole bunch of books because, you know, the, uh, Samina will know this from Michigan. At that time, we had three different influences. We had Sikhe Pralad with a very field-based influence. We had Berger Van Affelt with a very mathematical, analytical approach, and Cynthia Montgomery with a very empirical approach. So I ended up reading all these different types of things. And um, I would say when I read Rommel's work, I said, you know, this is interesting. I can do something on M&A, and he's done something on diversification. And really understand whether with stock returns you get the same results as you do with uh, with uh, accounting returns um, and also i felt that the market for corporate control might compete away the the benefits of relatedness so that was the question i pursued interesting okay and uh, who was your advisor cynthia montgomery was my advisor okay. uh, on the thesis burger bonafelt was on uh, on the committee uh, C.K. Prala is very much involved and he actually wanted me to do field work mm -hmm. and he kept saying, you know, don't just keep spinning tapes, you know, you've got to go out and meet people. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get a job. So yeah. I spun the tapes. Oh, that's great. So we're related in some way because Cynthia was a Purdue, Purdue yes. grad. So, so. He was, yes. That's great. Um, uh, and 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 uh, who were, uh, I mean, when I was a uh, young scholar, even now, Bruce Kogut was my, is my academic idol. I think Kogut's fantastic, right? Uh, everything he writes has such magic in it for me. 
Um, who was your academic? I know Bruce was a, a co colleague of yours at Wharton. The author, yeah. yeah, one of my, I think my introduction to international business research came about by working with Bruce on this article on foreign direct investment and the role of cultural differences, where we created an index of uh, national cultural differences um, and, and cultural, yeah. So in terms of uh, idols, you know, that's a very, very good question. I had several different types of idols. I think actually in statistics, uh, Mahala Nobis, uh, who had this Mahal Nobis D squared measure of deviation from uh, up to calculate outliers, he actually did that with uh, studies of crops in India. So this was somebody who actually was sitting somewhere in India doing this work. And I thought that was amazing. And it became part of every computer package uh, but I, certainly in the field, I would say Dick Rumelt, um, you know, Alfred Chandler, um, certainly C.K. Pralad, um, Cynthia Montgomery, and then okay. you can go down the list. I mean, uh, you know, some of my contemporaries, Jay Barney and others have made tremendous contributions. Um, I will say that to me, the most interesting thing, since this is about us being researchers, is to really triangulate three things. One is the phenomenon itself, which is the phenomenon of strategy or decision-making. And my management science kind of that I did for a year and a half was very useful in that, the modeling idea, abstracting from the phenomenon. The second is kind of theory building. And the third is the empirical uh, rigor. And triangulating the three things is I think really, really important. But you have to look at your own competitive advantage and you know work from there. I think that's the other choice one has to make. Uh, so that's kind of how I, some of my idols are in the phenomena area, some are in the empirical and some are in the theory. Okay. Right. Now, um, like my own work, your work might be characterized as pertaining to corporate strategy. Right. And you are one of the pioneers uh, in corporate strategy and continue to be uh, with work on diversification with Cynthia Montgomery and Ned Bowman mm -hmm. in the in the 80s and Jay Anand in the 90s. Um, uh, with him, your work touched upon alliances and entry and Bruce Kogut, uh, Maurizio Zolo, Sijin Chang, Prashant Kakalde, Ranjay Gulati, Jeff Dyer. Um, and your work on alliances uh, in the 90s continues uh, uh, with this corporate strategy theme and alliance processes. And that kind of evolved into, into work on dynamic capabilities, what we call now dyna dynamic capabilities in 2000s or so. Right. So I don't know if that's an accurate characterization of, of your work. Uh, and it's only a handful of the people that you've worked with, and I don't mean to dishonor those those people by leaving them out. But uh, uh, um, so, how do you think about corporate strategy and the journey that you've been on? Yeah, um, uh, my most recent uh, co-author actually is uh, Asim, who's on the on the call. So Asim might might weigh in with. Uh, the frustrations of being a co-author as well, but certainly we did some good things on private equity and how that market works. Um, but I would say that that's a great uh, summary, by the way, of my, uh, my journey, uh, Tim. So thank you for that. Um, I would say corporate strategy, uh, Jay Barney told me this about 15 years ago. He was saying, is corporate strategy just going to fizzle out? And he meant it not in a negative way. He was kind of trying to say, it has to be big, it has to be important. And you look today and you see corporate strategy is in fact extremely important today. So I'll give you, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I've been doing, the CK Pralad influence is always trying to look at the phenomenon. And um, I was speaking to someone at uh, McKinsey and Company about where, in this whole issue of where profits come from, I asked, you know, where does competitive advantage come from in your mind, okay? And I was surprised at the answer. The answer was where to play is more important than how to play. So corporate strategy is actually the bigger question in their practice today. And I've heard this from multiple people. It's not that I talk to consultants for field work, but I happen to talk to 
someone who was one of my uh, students there. And then uh, uh, if you think about why that's the case, look at the role of activist investors today, something very, very new. And of course, it's a, it's a reprise of what happened in the 80s with the, they were called uh, corporate raiders then, and now they're rebranded as activists. It sounds a lot better. Um, but, you know, um, this notion of growth is important, but value creation is also important. And this tension between growth and value creation, um, I don't think because there are, because there are kind of uh, discrete steps in growth with external growth, you are always in some imbalance between growth and value creation. And that's why we see this ongoing question of this company has not created value, this other one has, and the CEO comes in and, um, you know, there's some other field work by, uh, that somebody did on what CEOs can do. Their tenure is reducing, and so what they do is inorganic transactions, acquisitions, divestitures, partnerships, because they can't wait for the, it takes too long for the organic stuff to happen, you know. Um, think about what's happening in GE, right? I mean, uh, they've had a series of uh, departed CEOs because they want to fix some very, very big problems and organic growth is not going to do it. And in fact, Flannery, who's a Wharton graduate, whom I don't know, was not uh, CEO of GE for just, uh, I think, maybe a year and a half. And he got, he got uh, asked to leave because he was moving too slowly. So I think this issue of corporate strategy really is about where to play and the imbalance between growth and value maximization that growth, if you take inorganic growth, is, is discrete, it's not continuous. So you don't, get to, you don't get to that optimal point, as it were. Tim, I think you're muted. Uh, okay, I'm taking notes, so that's, uh, that's very insightful, okay. Now, um, uh, so uh, it's nice to get your, your thoughts on corporate strategy and how you think it seems to be uh, actually increasingly important. Uh, yeah. And so that suggests it's, it's more relevant uh, for companies today than it, it might have been before. Um, uh, now, here we are in the midst of this coronavirus um, issue, and I've actually seen some evidence of... Um, firms, uh, corporate strategies changing uh, in the midst of this corona. Have you seen any evidence uh, of examples of corporate strategy and, and some of the, how the virus has affected uh, the corporate strategy of firms? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a great question because you also work in corporate strategies. So, you know, uh, you're thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the more obvious ones are, of course, Microsoft and Amazon and uh, Zoom, which we are using. Um, but some of the other interesting ones, there's a company called Pin Duo Duo, which is in Shanghai, whose market value went up by $55 billion because they are kind of a fulfillment company in China. And the logistics of you know, shipping from China to other places and you know, handing off to other vendors, um, their, their value has gone up dramatically uh, there's a company called Atlassian from Australia, which is kind of a collaboration software company. Um, I kind of came across Atlassian maybe three years ago. And I was just saying, who are these guys? And they, they had a kind of world-class collaboration software, B2B. And it was a niche, you know. And what happened was, with the rise of this coronavirus, that has just taken off. And they can't even handle their growth. Their market value has gone up 15 billion since the coronavirus started. Of course, you have uh, Moderna, which uh, presumably has something, uh, some, uh, some compound for uh, COVID-19. It's, it's very early and who knows. Uh, their market cap went up 20 billion. Um, and then there's uh, Roche, which is in a partnership with a Chinese company called Chugai. And there's some uh, Actemra, which is also apparently a, a product that is doing well. So you see companies 
uh, kind of taking advantage of this. I, I mean, some of them are just fortunate, but again, it's a competitive game, right? That's what's interesting. Everybody has the same opportunity. And you see some people, and we're back to the Nelson and Winter or the Winter idea about repeatable process. I think those who have a repeatable process that they can hitch to this, uh, this, this new business model and they can scale it. So, you know, Henderson had this idea of architectural component competence and component competence. I think those who have the architectural competence actually are the ones who are able to take advantage because component competence uh, which is, you know, particular routines in particular places or particular modules may not be enough. Um, and one thing you said, which I found very interesting, I mean, as you were looking at my journey, uh, that you actually inferred what was very much an intent in my journey, which was to look at alliance and acquisition capability in terms of codified and tacit knowledge and repeatable process as really a window into how capabilities are produced. And today, again, we're seeing post-COVID, we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I was very pleased as I was prepping for this interview this morning to open up my email and see that you won this award, uh, the CK Prahalad Award. And I, I'd like you to say something about it. And the, and the last question is kind of a nice bridge to that because it suggests your involvement in, uh, in practice and right. your influence on practice. And this award today that you, uh, that was announced is uh, suggestive of that. So let me, if you don't mind, let me just spend a minute uh, reading an excerpt from this announcement uh, that SMS put out. Uh, Harbour's Research Centers on Managing Alliances and Acquisitions, Corporate Governance and Business Development. With his relational view and work on the dedicated alliance fu function being some of the most influential in alliance research. His work has been published in a number of quality journals, blah, 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 and is, um, um, and is an among the most cited work in the field of strategic management. Uh, his book, Strategic Leaders Road Roadmap, which integrates strategy and leadership principles, has greatly inspired executives, as did his books, Fortune Makers, The Leaders Creating China's Great Global Companies, and the India way. So uh, there's, a, there's another book that I missed, I apologize, which illustrate how these principles have been applied in these emerging economies. Harbir's practical advice in articles such as how to make strategic alliances work served as a template for implementation and guided executives in many companies, some of which invited Harbir to advise them as a consultant. In almost four decades of teaching and executive education programs at the Wharton School, and engaging in open and customized programs in leading companies such as Daimler-Benz, Philips, Accenture, the Tata Group, uh, Aditya, Birla Group, and Nissan. Harbir has brought together academic rigor and managerial relevance and shaped the perspective of executives in the US, Europe, and Asia, underscoring the human element and the nurturing of soft managerial skills. So, uh, you know, this is an important award in several respects, one of which is it's, it's uh, named after one of your mentors. But I, I'm wondering if you'd just like to make any comment with regards to, to that award and what it means to you. Uh, thanks, Tim. Of course, it was a huge uh, surprise because these are done, I think, looking at resumes and so on, a very pleasant uh, surprise. It has great resonance for me because CK was uh, the person who, asked me to think about joining the field. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I, um, it was a time when strategy was really, my, I, I joined the field and then I went to the fir my first Academy of Management meeting where we spent two days discussing what is strategy. And I was saying, my God, I'm in a field where they don't know what the field is. But then I love the debate. And I think, uh, you know, people of Indian origin and others who know people of Indian origin know that Indians love to argue. So I said, <laughs> you know, this is the right place. This is the place for me. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was a big step. And I think CK is what, what resonated with me, I still remember, is he said, you know, it, you want to be in a field where the ideas are still growing. And this place, the ideas are growing. And, and he had done field work in his thesis on the functioning of the multinational corporation. And so he felt that decision-making in the diversified corporation 
would be is a black box and would take some unpacking so i think i uh, lay a lot of credit at his feet for you know inviting me to join the field that's great and i know you've you've worked with a lot of um a lot of outstanding scholars and you've nurtured a lot of outstanding scholars um i uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just mention a few of your doctoral students that you've, you've nurtured. I think I'm getting most of the ones for which you were either advisor or chair. I know Wharton does, uh, uh, has both, both those roles. So uh, Gary Moskowitz, Maurizio Zolo, Vipin Gupta, Jay Anand, Piero Morissini. I apologize if I'm mis mispronouncing names. Sijin Chang, uh, Fanish, Kiranam, uh, Sendal Atharaj, Prashant Kale, Farid Haryanto, uh, let's see, Andy Chang, Piero Morosini, uh, Vikas Akarwal, Akarwal, Elisa Alvarez Garrido, Anuja Gupta, Joydeep Chatterjee, Anindya Go, Ghosh, Asim Kaul, who's with us today, Sarath Balachandran, Shiva Agaral, Pesha McGrath, Ram Ranganatham, and Lisa Tang. And I, if, I, if we left anybody out, uh, please forgive us. But uh, mostly I, I wanted to highlight uh, that many of those names we all know uh, and have left a huge imprint on the field. But there's, there's also a huge list of, of folks. Uh, uh, so... Um, you must be doing something right, uh, Harbir, and I think I know how you're going to answer that. But, uh, <laughs> but there are lots of people like me uh, that work with doctoral students, and we wish we could, we could work effectively with them. And, and uh, um, what are your secrets? Well, I think, um, very honestly, I think um, they're very talented people, and, um, and I mean that sincerely. And, and it was really about trying to identify what the gaps were that, or what might be impediments and trying to work through those. Um, and that's the mo probably the most important thing. I think it's about the person. And uh, um, I, I think people had different packages of skills and trying to sort of help them see places where uh, they might need to, it's almost like a coaching, coaching job, you know, uh, so, so it's really about, you know, as a coach, you see, well, what does the player need to, to up their game? And uh, the player is better at that game than you are. You're the coach, you know. So I think that was the one analogy I would take. Um, the second one is, um, I, I think I really like to work on things I'm very excited about. And I think my students, um, I think they, they were excited about their questions. And I think that really helped uh, moving the needle forward. The third thing was uh, trying to get access to phenomena any way we could, whether it was, you know, surveys or, uh, you know, reading accounts about these decision makers or doing some kind of pilot, you know, um, uh, as I seen the, the paper that we did on private equity, there was a student who had, studied the chemical industry and had seen some things. Uh, so, you know, we kind of scaled it up. So I think the triangle of phenomena, theory, and method, I think sort of trying to use all of them, but really trying to understand what's the particular strength of the student and the student in combination with me, if it was some joint work. Right. At what point in a student's uh, journey do you um, connect them with practice? So I think we did, we had a seminar in strategy that I teach and I, I think from the, I, I used to have a couple of HBR articles in that, which was, you know, uh, deliberate. Um, I think uh, I still do this. I ask people to, for each session, come up with a, you know, something on the outside world, whether it's their own experience or reading an article about a company, doing resources, I want to see a list of resources of a particular company, 
go to capabilities i want to see capabilities you talk about strategic leaders i want to see strategic leaders just so that we kind of understand what kind of data is out there and also with the group people have different insights some people have worked in particular companies so i think that generated this idea that we need to also look outside but i, I again i think in all fairness it's about the talent of the students and and in any phd phd programs by definition have get very motivated people and so you have very talented people and it's about unlocking helping them unlock their talent i think you are uh, muted again tim i think i want to i want to open it up to the audience on this issue because i my sense is that there may be others it could be that the people on the on the the video are are so new in their careers and they're not working with doctoral students but but if there are any questions about the doctoral process and how harbeer manages please uh, please ask those in the chat feature and you could ask asim what what his experience was and if it's at all consistent with what i'm talking about yeah asim are you prepared to discuss that actually <laughs> Well, so the only thing I'll say, uh, I mean, Tim, to your question is, um, you know, my first ever RA project with Harbir was actually half a consulting project with with a with a company. Uh, I guess it's okay to mention that um, with Cisco, uh, where we oh, were right. looking at right. We were kind of doing this project, trying to help Cisco think about their small and medium enterprise business, but mm -hmm. also using that to think about. Cisco's acquisition capabilities, right? So it was a beautiful. I mean, I have to admit, it never actually quite went anywhere. But, but that's probably my fault. But you know, I I think it, it's a great example of the kind of seamless integration of of theory and and practice uh, or sure. acad academia and practice that I think was very much part of uh -huh. uh, the experience of sort of uh, being advised by Harbier. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. But remember the the on the Dev on the PE project, it was a somebody who five years ago had seen private equity acquisitions in uh, from pharma companies, yeah, from chemical yeah. companies. I, I, I mean, literally, like we started that project by just talking to people about, you know, w what were their experiences with PE acquisitions, and I think we the spark for that was just. The stories we were hearing were so different from the sort of standard corporate radar stories. We said, okay, we have to write a paper about this. And then we said, okay, how do we, what's the theory and what's the data, right? But again, it's the spark coming from, right, right. from, from actual experience. And Asim, this came up and uh, this came out two years ago. Asim then scaled it up big time, took it across industries and all kinds of things. I don't think it would have got published. It was just the industry specific thing we started with. Um, and, and, and I just want to say one more thing as we open up uh, to others. Um, I think that one doesn't have to identify company A and go there. I think there are these natural connections and I think that takes us quite a long way. Uh, and I think that's, uh, but we have to be, uh, we have to be sort of focused on the question a bit more and abstract enough from the question to get somewhere. Here's a question from Samina. So how do you guide students in narrowing their dissertation topics? So it's very interesting. I mean, I, I think um, it's all over the lot. I mean, some students come in with what's a 10 year agenda and they don't know it. Uh, others come in with, you know, very few come in with a smaller than a dissertation idea. So most of the time you're scaling it down. Um, I think there's also the issue of, um, of just trying to understand what's the contribution. And uh, I think that's, uh, and I remember I should mention my own experience actually uh, in that regard. I'll just answer, I'll just do this and I'll talk about my own experience, which was very, it was hilarious, but at that time it was painful. Um, you know, so, so uh, I think the, the, the point is um, students are reading the best papers in each class. They're the best papers. And so some people feel they have a very long hill to climb and this idea is worthless because it's not there. So a lot of it is to say, hey, this is actually a good idea. Let's pursue this. And I think that's part of what I do. But just my own experience, which certainly informed me later on, I passed my comprehensive exams 
at Michigan. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna look around for a thesis. And I took a month off, you know, drove around the country, came back and began thinking great thoughts. And then three months into it, people began asking me, so what's the thesis? And I said, I'm, I'm working on it. And then, you know, I kept, I kept saying I'm working on it. So by the time I came into their offices with a thesis idea, they already had a very low opinion of me by that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought they thought I was next thing to sliced bread. And then I came up with this 10 year agenda and they said, this is completely non-researchable, go away, you know? So I was astonished, you know? So I think uh, students tend to miss or to miscalibrate scale among other things and miscalibrate their own capacity. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and uh, are you more of a hands-on or hands-off advisor? It varies a lot. I think it's person-specific. I think with the seam, uh, you'll probably confirm I was pretty hands-off. Is that fair, right? Good description. Um, in some cases, I guess... You said, I'm sorry, just to clarify, you said hands-off. Hands-off. Okay. Because he, he has so much talent, he just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> no. Every time I asked him to revise it, he would write a new paper. I said, okay, Asim, let's just do this one. And no, let's your... be clear. Every time I came to you with something, you would basically give me the one deep inside that destroyed the paper, and then I would have to write a new paper. <laughs> okay. I, I, didn't, I just saw new papers. I was wondering what's going on, but he's a fast writer, you know, so hands off mostly. Uh, but I think at times, you know, um, one has to really help in the writing process because uh, people don't, uh, it's a certain style of writing. And, uh, you know, I get very involved in the writing process uh, just to illustrate early on, and then we let it go. And it's interesting, some people come with long, with complete drafts, with others I would, most of the time I'd say start with an outline, and then go to a longer outline, then write a section, and that way we can get the, you know, the wheels turning. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, well, you know, I have, I have some more questions I want to ask you, uh, particularly how you interact with executives um, and your teaching and your research. But Anita McGann is with us, and she has a very provocative question herself. So, Anita, nice uh, to see you. Oh, it's so nice to see you and, and to hear this, this story of your development, uh, Harbier. Uh, thank you for that. The, the question I wanted to ask um, relates to the theories that support uh, our understanding of diversification. And uh, I wanted to ask you whether or not you're concerned about whether diversification is under theorized in the face of two big challenges that are going on. Uh, the first one's in the world, this uh, uh, move away from liberalized trade and toward greater nationalism, which mm -hmm. all else equal would seem, you know, to potentially constrain firm scope. Um, at least uh, geographically. And then the second is the stakeholder view of the firm, uh, which of course, Asim, your student has contributed to so greatly, yes. um, where you know, there's this challenge to the shareholder argument about whether diversification you know, it, it makes sense. And you know, a lot of our theories about diversification compare diversification, uh, um, merger and acquisition with uh, alliances. And a lot of that logic is a is it relates to shareholder kind of uh, points of view. Does the stakeholder argument, you know, raise fundamental new questions about the basis of diversification? Yes, very, uh, I think there's the many layers to the question, but a very, very important question. And Anita, you have, uh, you've done so much in the area as well. So love to hear more about your thoughts. Um, I think, the, this issue of purpose is going to become fundamental down the road, the pursuit of purpose. This is not a flash in the pan. I think um, too much has gone on in terms of maximizing shareholder value as the only goal. And you see that with the business roundtable coming in with a public statement that they're going to pursue, that they're going to sort of signal that uh, there's a there's a more of a multi-stakeholder agenda. Uh, the second uh, issue that relates to purpose is um, really about some interesting research. I think it's in applied economics, um, but it has a behavioral piece to it. 
that company is there was a survey of purpose uh, a pursuit of purpose within the company you know high and low kind of a scale not a very good scale but what they found was that the pursuit of purpose was associated with higher performance that in a sense the trade the presumed trade off the milton friedman trade off um maybe maybe either time bound or maybe an assumption that people have pursued so i think purpose is going to be really we have to study the pursuit of purpose now having said that how do you research it is a huge question and we'll see what happens with that uh, i think your second point around multinationals and globalization is an excellent one as well uh, i'll make a different point which which is important to me i just discovered it uh, actually doing some field work that private equity more and more companies have gone private the number of public companies in the new york stock exchange has dropped substantially i think as much as maybe 60% in the last few years why is that you know and and uh, as asim was noting it couldn't be that the private equity people are just you know uh, sharks pursuing value managers are opting to go there and they talk about more patient money and so on so i'm not saying private equity is a solution but what i'm saying is the errors of the public corporation and the and the short termism that that comes with it um and the cosmetic nature of judgment of ceo performance um need to be addressed and uh, there's rhetoric is not enough so you're going to see the business round table doing some things you'll see companies going private and that has its own trade offs um i think however that companies like danaher which have managed to execute long term uh, are probably in the right place in other words i think a lot of this is rhetoric um and uh, activist investors when they attack companies according to some research i just saw um are mostly right in the targets they identify they're taking risk uh, and by the way they have the collaboration of the block holder i was saying how can it be that an activist investor can be right so often and the i mean statistically right how can you be right so often in an efficient market and the answer is that the block holders are actually collaborating with them and this is really there the the face on the front end so i think the model i think implicitly your question is is the model of the public shareholder owned diversified firm under threat the answer my answer is yes, yes. but the all these thre- all the all these strands <laughs> the globalization thing actually i have a point of view and my point of view is that there's a lot of interdependence below the surface so it's very hard to unwind the interdependence that exists uh, and the cost of unwinding is very high uh, so i think we'll see what happens i think we'll we'll see how companies evolve um, and i think one of the things they'll do is second sourcing hedging strategies um, bruce cogat by the way to your point tim had this idea of uh, a real options approach to supply chain and that was kind of in the 80s you know that you you have supply chains as a real option and you hedge against them i think that's going to happen now i think okay. suppose okay. hypothesis okay and if you don't mind herbier i know this is an interview for you but but uh, anita um do you do you want to react to herbier yeah, what are your thoughts <laughs> this is no, a i mean i, I... I'd love to hear your thoughts too Tim you know this is your your research area but uh no thank you so so much for such a thoughtful answer I think this this idea of piercing kind of the the veil of distance between the firm and its shareholders its investors yeah. is a very fruitful area if, if investors are another stakeholder that um has that contributes um you know as 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 Cynthia would say a fungible resource which is investment capital then that's very different than if they're contributing advice and resource and you know uh, expertise such as a private equity investor would and you know access to uh, particular networks and things like that and i don't think that our field has theorized that fully yet um yeah. and that there's a big opportunity yeah i uh, thank you that's uh, i completely agree and and, and uh, anita let me ask you this question and then everybody else actually 
uh, I think that uh, the journals are starting to become more open again on bigger issues. I think for a while, it's not the journals, it's the, the, the body politic of uh, reviewers and all that. We got very hung up on, you know, uh, endogeneity issues, selection issues, and the questions became very narrow. I think what you're asking is a very, very big question, and it yeah. requires a field-based work, but also exploratory analysis. It won't be clean in every way but we need to have that see the light of day. I agree, very much yeah. so. Yeah, and the, the journals now, I think, are so much more, um, you know, the, 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 the titles and the abstracts of the SMJ for every, every, every issue that comes in, to mm -hmm. me, all the papers are interesting. And, you know, a few years back, um, I, I don't want to say they weren't interesting, but they, they, they tended to focus much more on an established, narrow set of ideas. And uh, that's changing. I agree with that. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic given what we see. Uh, and there are also strategy science and others. I think there's interest, but I, I think the rigor is important. Uh, I wanted to make one last point just before we leave that on this whole issue of questions was, I've actually been very impressed with this debate around effective medications for coronavirus. And for me, I think what's fascinating is the stakes are so high and yet the standards of evidence are not compromised by the scientists. And I think this notion of rigor versus relevance, which as we hear in my early days, I think this is an example of rigor and relevance. And I think um, one question is, if you're doing a piece of research, would you answer the question as if your life depended on it? You know, I think that might be a way to think about how, how serious the stakes are. Those are the questions we work on. Does the yeah. corporation survive? Do CEOs stay in their jobs, et cetera? I was, I, I, one of my students is a guy named Ar Ar Arkady Sakartov. Oh, yeah. and he, he did a nice uh, dissertation and resource redeployment. And a few years after his defense and his first few years at Wharton with you, Harbir, I, I would visit with him and he would, he would say, well, you know, I'm really, really down on the future of corporate strategy. The people that I talk to uh, are, um, just don't think there's much potential for, the, 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 in, in other words, the trajectory is downward. And I didn't agree with him at the time, and I certainly don't agree with him now. I mean, it seems to me that the questions like the one uh, Anita raised and you responded to are more important than ever. But uh, maybe you should react to that, Herb Beer. What do you, what do you think about the, the thesis that corporate strategy is in a downward trajectory? I think, you know, uh, both can be right in some sense. If you look at the speakers coming into seminar series, you see a lot of, you know, controlled experiments and so on. Uh, some of which have import for corporate strategy. Um, but I think if you look outside your window, you see a lot of important things happening with firms and, and so on. And so you know that these issues are alive and well. Um, and I think the research, I think strategy is better than, as a field is, is more open than many uh, adjacent fields. And I think we often feel that we are kind of claustrophobic because of methodological constraints. But actually, people can ask some pretty complex questions and pursue them. And I'd love to hear from people in the group about this. Uh, I think it's about pursuing a multi-year, multiple project kind of agenda, not a single paper agenda. And then you can do some of those, you know, those rigorous uh, designs, but your, your trajectory is really, is really, uh, uh, along an important path. One of the finance papers I was talking about with respect to activist investors uh, asked, asked a really big question, but they did it with a research design where um, it was really firms that could be in either the top, the standard S&P 500, the S&P 1000, and add that interface and how they went up and down on that interface on market value was one of the randomized variables that they had a peer with who was also going up and down on those, on those deciles. Uh, so I think uh, with a big question, one can still design uh, those important issues. But, but yeah, I think uh, I'm fascinated about what Arkady reported. And I think that's, that is a valid observation. 
uh, when you look at some of the talks and other things we see. Mm -hmm. I, I see there's a question that's related to this issue by Nakisha. Uh, Nakisha, you want to join us and offer your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Hopefully you can hear, maybe not see me yet, but I'll ask my question. Um, so I'm, I'm going into my second year at Baruch uh, College and I focus on looking at mergers and acquisitions. And so I wanted to get your, your thought on the current environment, looking at all these prominent retail companies that are going into bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we always talk about synergistic values and finance and building value for the firm. I just wanted to get your thoughts about the opportunities that are happening now with so many companies available to be purchased or acquired. Right. See if there's more value than normal during this time period. Thank I think we yeah, a very important point. I think um, uh, absolutely. I think you're going to see uh, somebody was saying that COVID is the the dream of all randomized control uh, designers because you have the ultimate shock, right? Uh, and that's one thing, but in my view, just specifically on M&A and the scope of the firm, um, this idea of where to play versus how to play is going to be really, really important. And you see that with, you know, Lord and Taylor going bankrupt, uh, you, know, uh, um, you, you know, many, many others, right? Um, what was it, Neiman Marcus, uh, Brooks Brothers, that have been around for over a hundred years, declaring bankruptcy. Uh, and the question really is, how will they re redeploy their capabilities back to what Tim works on? Uh, how do you redeploy your capabilities to higher value uh, uh, opportunities? And of course there's uncertainty. And, and the last line on that SMS um, citation is interesting because I do believe the human element and the decision maker and, and even biases and decision, we haven't really talked about biases in decision making. I think there's an established literature there. You can think about anchoring and adjustment, for example, the anchoring bias, are people anchored on the wrong strategy? And so their adjustment around that anchor is not, not enough. You know, uh, so I think you're going to see managers and decision makers needing to make radical changes uh, and of course there's risk so you're going to see a distribution of outcomes mm -hmm. it's an excellent question by the way you can do experimental work on that too do an experiment psychological experiment do a analytical work with statistics etc and there's a, a person by the name of anirvan anirvan pant uh, would you like to offer your question? Hello, Harbi. Thanks for taking time out for us today. So uh, it was uh, fascinating to hear you talk about the evolution of your ideas. And uh, a few minutes ago, as we were talking of uh, the, uh, the better understanding we have today of uh, stakeholder capitalism, I was reminded of uh, this piece a few years ago by Dobbin Jung on how uh, shareholder value maximization became an ideology. Now, I was wondering if today we are again at maybe some perfect storm conditions mm -hmm. for a realignment of ideology. There are newer actors, I think outspoken employees, particularly in Silicon Valley firms have become very important stakeholders uh, in corporate strategy, I would feel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was wondering if there is, uh, you, you have any thoughts on whether we should be looking actively and theoretically at the low, role of ideology in corporate strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think the, with the right tools um, from political science, uh, ideology might be an interesting uh, lens with which to look at corporate strategy. That's an interesting point. Um, I do see that in, I have not looked at the governance literature lately, but uh, in the governance literature, corporate governance literature, there was a strand around managerialism and the managerialism strand had to do partly with ideologies that people had that were different from the stockholder maximizing ideology. 
So that might be worth worth looking at as a as a possible lens. Uh, I would kind of go and maybe connect it more to a different idea. If you look at uh, an article by Pralad and Bettis, which was called the dominant logic, and I think that's a very very interesting article and very applicable today. That how is the dominant what kind of dominant logic might surface within an organization. Um, in the context of a rapidly changing environment. Um, so that would be something to look at. Um, speaking of field work, and I, I'll keep my answer short because there may be other questions. Um, but speaking of field work, I'm reminded of uh, opportunistically doing some field work. Uh, Indra Nui from Pepsi, the former CEO, had just stepped down, I think, a year ago, and she was speaking in Philadelphia um, about her career. And she was CEO of Pepsi for 12 years. And she was very, very frank. It was an audience of about 100 people. Uh, but, you know, if you're a professor, you could get a ticket to the thing. And, and she was saying that when she joined Pepsi, they really wanted to compete with Coke. And it was all about selling sugar water. And she came in and said, this was 12 years ago, 14 years ago now, and said, we can't sell only sugary drinks. We have to sell, we can't sell salty snacks. And you know, she actually said this in her speech. She said that some board members immediately said, we knew something was wrong with this person. We don't know what it was, but now we know what it is. She is not really shareholder oriented. Okay. And it took her about a year to battle that. And according to her, she almost got fired. But then what Pepsi did in terms of diversifying its portfolio, reducing the salt levels, actually put them in a much stronger push up position and her concept was profit with purpose. And that's one of the early people who did purpose. So, so I think there are some, uh, the dominant logic might be a easier path than ideology, which has, you know, many other dimensions to it. Thank you. There's a, there's a few more questions here, but I, I want to ask you a few uh, before we get um, yeah. too far along. Uh, you know, I guess when you won this award, it suggests that you work closely with executives and it, it, it suggests, I think there's enough evidence to suggest that you're very effective in working with executives. So from your, your uh, experience, what are the unique skills that scholars need to develop mm -hmm. to be effective with executives? Uh, so it's a very good question. Um, and I, I don't think I'm you know, there are people who are more effective without a doubt. Uh, so it's really about knowing when to seek access, how to seek access, uh, take, a, take, take an opportunity when it prevents itself, presents itself. Um, I was lucky that when I transferred to Strategy CK, I had a project with a glass company, Owens, Illinois, and they were going to try to build solar collectors. And he needed, he needed someone to do a, like a three month project on alternative technologies. So in the summer that year, I spent three months studying photovoltaic technology, uh, you know, the water cooled uh, uh, solar technology, solar tube technology, the, the solar collectors which are there now, uh, also other, other technologies. Photovoltaic, by the way, which is now here, was not even uh, viable then, uh, but CK went and presented that to these execs and I learned a lot from that. He didn't say, you've done this work and this is an answer. He said, well, what do you think is going to work? You know, which technology do you think is going to work? And they said, well, we want to take our tubes and put a coating on it and then sell it. And he said, why do you think that's going to work? So he kind of used the case discussion model with a deep amount of work that we had done and brought that at the end. And so what I learned from that was that you always try to understand what energizes your respondent. You start from there, but you have to come well prepared. You have to have something to give. And he had this young, you know, and I, I was literally off the boat a year ago. So young fellow who looks like the only reason he's here is because he sits in the library all day. So he said, he's the guy, you know, you, you tell us about photovoltaic, you tell us about this. So, you know, you have to come in with some preparation. And I learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I'll keep my answers short now, so. And, and so, so 
you know, maybe, maybe your answer pertains to what I'm going to ask next, but, but perhaps you can elaborate. What, what's your teaching style with executives and how does it differ from regular MBAs? Uh, I think the, surprisingly, the notes are almost exactly the same. I would say 90% are the same. Uh, but I use a lot of, I use a lot of exercises along the way. And I usually have, uh, if I can, I have a, a, a set of prep questions around the issue. So I ask them, you know, for example, if it's on m and I'll ask them to come in beforehand with successful and unsuccessful transactions in their knowledge base. Uh, and then I also ask them about, during the course of the session, about what they think drives success or failure. So it's kind of this uh, more interactive and I think they are very comfortable without cases to be given to them. They can bring in their own cases. They debate whether they are right or wrong. They'll say, well, you know, I don't have all the data. So it's really uh, same notes, uh, questions that have to do with application. But the other thing that I think we all can do, and I have discovered that it was quite effective, was to give them baselines. I try to use research to say, this is what we know, you know, about this particular thing. And uh, invariably, when we do M&A, they say, well, this is just abnormal returns. How do you know about satisfaction? How do you know about And I say, well, we don't know. But then do you know? You know, so, so I think that they're comfortable as long as you don't claim you have answers, mm -hmm. but you're a resource, they're okay. Mm -hmm. and, I, I don't, and I don't think it's about being the most charming and the most, you know, uh, exciting. I've, had, I've had, followed people who have have them hanging from the rafters. I once followed a group where this was an Indian company and somebody I would not name before that, this was a software consulting company. And before me, someone had worked with them and said, you should be like McKinsey. You should be flying first class meeting CEOs in the US. And I came in and I asked them to do some things. And I said, you know, you shouldn't meet CEOs in the US. You know, you're not, you don't know what baseball teams, you don't know, you know, football, you know, all of that. Uh, how are you going to even get in the door? But you can scale up your software business and your outsourcing business. And they were really angry with me. They said, this guy is, you know, a jerk and all of that. But then afterwards, uh, they kind of, I was just saying that, you know, stick to your core competence. <laughs> that, that was the basic point, you know. So uh, sometimes you can be successful with audiences by telling them something that is actually not implementable. And I have taken the heat at times by saying, this is actually not implementable. And I'm not trying to discourage that. And I may be wrong, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, you know, yeah. So they think, you know, if you're nerdy and you're whatever, they don't, that's fine. You're playing your role. You're not a television host. Yeah. Um, yesterday, our uh, interviewee, um, uh, talked about how they no longer use cases mm -hmm. with executives. Is that a difference? Do you, do you not use case studies? I actually am one of the few who does. Um, um, but I, I do ask a lot of questions around short examples and I break up the case into particular questions that they connect with the short examples. Mm -hmm. Um, the downside is, I, I can understand why the person said that, the downside is that people feel the case is old or narrow or, you know, too non-generalizable. And, um, but I think the flip side is that you can give them a bit more depth uh, that, that they really need, you know. Uh, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Without the case or with the case, you can do, give more depth with, with, with the, the case. case. I don't yeah. think you can go deep without the case. Uh -huh. and, and if someone really asks me, I say, you know, if I'm teaching you surgery, then don't you want to know about, you know, the, the track record of, you know, using this scalpel versus that scalpel? I mean, so I just say, hey, you know, do whatever you want, you know, you, you just go, go for it, you know. Uh -huh. So, you know, I think that that works. But I, again, I think it's, I don't think I can do the non-case thing. I can, I've done it, but it's not as good. Uh -huh. And the others who, who just, they're comfortable doing that and they've learned how to do that. So it's mm -hmm. personal style is the word I would say. Okay. Now, um, 
Uh, also, when you talk with the executives, uh, what, what corporate strategy issues are at the top of their minds at this point in time? Uh, there's probably a selection bias. Uh, sure. Because yeah. they approach you, uh, the corporate strategy the expert. With, yeah, the but, I mean, yeah. But, um, so I think the, I'm going to answer it in two ways. So there's a program we've done for a long time on M&A which I teach with a, a finance professor. And of course, these people want the tools. And so that's very straightforward. They want to do, you know, we have a case running through, I do the strategy part, he does the finance part, we have a legal part. Uh, but if I look at our general management program, it's called the advanced management program, it's general management program. I think what they are most concerned about is uh, what in fact, um, Anita was asking, you know, the issue of, uh, the right scope of the firm and uh, are we, how do we, is there a new paradigm out there or are we just struggling with, uh, you know, rapidly changing environment? And so that's the big debate that they have in their minds. Yeah. And uh, specifically, there's some energy around divestiture. Um, they find the real options idea very interesting. Uh, I think on globalization, there's a huge debate but, I'm uh, sorry, can, can, let me stop you a minute because you talked about real options. So what element of the real options stuff do they it's find? It's interesting, in? yeah. So real options, it's not, you know, it's, it's more the metaphor of real options rather than the technical side. Mm -hmm. But some people want the technical piece. I would say 10%, 15%. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but most of them resonate with the idea of a portfolio of options as a way to deal with uncertainty. Um, people do talk about exit, but they, you know, exit is very painful, right? We talk about it, but it's extremely painful and very yeah. political. Yeah. So I don't get too deep into uh, divestiture or acquisition. I talk much more about corporate strategy, which is, you know, what's the footprint of the firm? How do you create value? So I ask them to diagnose each of their businesses, which has competitive advantage, which does not have, and say, what would you do with the one that doesn't have competitive advantage today or mm -hmm. in the future? And that, I'm just kind of giving you a sense of where the action is. The action is much more around, corporate strategy is more than the sum of business unit strategy. I think that's the nexus. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. And I interrupted you uh, when you, <laughs> you started talking about hot topics and you mentioned global strategy. Right. Uh, maybe there was another, a longer list, but uh, no, did you want to elaborate I, on that? Yeah. I would just say that uh, um, there's a certain amount of faddishness in audiences, you know, so I tend to, I tend to take some risks. And so now people are saying, well, globalization is really bad. And I say, well, where's your shirt made and where's your component made? And has that changed yeah. you know, your parts? And then say that, well, do you think they'll change? So, so one has to do a bit of that and I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, and there is risk because they may say, you know, the guy is kind of, he's still thinking about the, you know, 2015. But uh, I think it's easy to fall in the trap of saying, Yes, you know, we should roll back everything from China. We should produce and I don't know where, you know, all those kinds of things. I'm not an advocate for China. I'm just simply saying this idea of hysteresis that Bruce Kogut has, which is, which is that you cannot change a supply chain from here to here. There will be kind of a, like in magnetism, a, a some amount of loss of magnetism when you do that. I think that that is something that they actually resonate with. Mm -hmm. And that opens up some discussion. Right. When it's now, not about ideology, it's about look at your problems and we'll talk about it. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. When you think about strategy, strategy questions, corporate strategy questions worth uh, exploring that are, un that are underknown. We've talked about a few of those. Anita's question. I think the issue that she raised on portfolio, yeah. uh, portfolio is a business. I don't think we know hardly anything about that topic. Right. And uh, uh, that's certainly a topic that's worth addressing. What other questions uh, in corporate strategy come to mind? Um, yeah. If you were to advise, and I'm sure you have, uh, young scholars, uh, 
what would you encourage them to, to look at? Um, I would say um, the one of the biggest ones is um, the tension between value creation today and value creation tomorrow. I think that is a very, very important question. <clears throat> the second question, and that has to do with, you know, the activist investor versus the, the internal team. How do you handle that? Um, and related to that is the question of um, how do you actually build your capabilities to do transactions? I think that uh, continues to be an important question. So people are it's, I think the research is showing that uh, acquisition capability and alliance capability are not necessarily positively correlated. There may be no correlation. There may be companies that have positive correlation, companies having negative correlation. And so I think that's an interesting question as to um, how firms kind of make choices when they may not be competent in particular transactions one piece of work that has not been done because it's difficult but is worth doing is the use of advisory firms versus in-house decision making. Um, how do we, there's a lot of that happening out there. Uh, and I think if we put our minds to it, we can get somewhere with that. What do you mean? Explain that a bit for advisory uh, firms. You mean consultants? Consulting, or? Consultants and investment bankers. So, you know, you often see firms kind of choosing uh, to go acquisition or alliance because that's what their experience base is. And I think the, the supplementing the comp competence with advisors might actually allow them to make the decisions. But then I think the issue of execution comes in and I think we've got to do more work on execution, which is around um, inorganic transactions. How do you make them perform at the same level as organic in terms of the in terms of the uh, political and organizational processes. I think that's a good question as well. Uh, and I think that those are some of the reasons why firms tend to underperform. I often hear this is this of can this just feel this may not be accurate. This is just a hypothesis based on field work. But a lot of people say that the analytics of corporate strategy are not that difficult. It is the implementation that's difficult. And also that how structured drive strategy, how, how the team kind of chooses their strategy based on what's worked in the past, which of course is the worst possible thing. Mm -hmm. This is a hypothesis. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, that is. Okay, uh, there has been a question by Agnieszka. Uh, so I'd just like to invite her to and ask them. Uh, yes, the, I, I've just recently been hearing that people talk a lot about um, collaboration, about uh, innovation, open innovation, about ecosystems. Right. And it, it kind of links to what, what you've been mentioned about different sort of decision making and what do what are we going to do uh, with our in-house versus um, outside capabilities. Right. And this links very much to the relational view. So I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on inter-organizational competitive advantage? during the time of coronavirus pandemic? Hmm. Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, firms are being required to uh, narrow their footprint because of financial reasons. And so those who are more, um, who are more capability oriented um, would presume to find partners and, and work with them. You know, in other words, move from wholly owned operations to part, a network of partnerships in the extreme case. Uh, but then that raises your demand on relational capability. So that's the first point. And it's worth thinking about. Uh, a second point is um, a concept that we put, uh, Jeff Dyer and I put in a recent article that was the revisited relational view in 2018. We put in the concept of interdependence uh, and thinking about interdependence as an important variable that affects the uh, delivery of value, potential value, the value appropriation versus value creation, but to some extent also drives value creation. Uh, and um, I kind of explored that with uh, NK modeling as an approach where you can kind of input 
a certain level of interdependence, high interdependence, medium, low, or any level. And uh, it, it turns out that interdependence in the operations really matters. And, and the greater the interdependence, the greater the need for equity in an alliance relationship. So I think to your question, I would say there's a natural experiment happening. And as firms try to reduce their footprint, once the incentives are over, uh, they would be using fewer wholly owned operations back to the question that Anita was asking. And then, so how do I do effective partnering? And in high interdependence situations, I probably need to avoid that and go to lower interdependence, but high asset specificity. So asset specificity and interdependence are not entirely correlated. Uh, and I think that's something to think about. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from Ab Abhi. Okay. Uh, hi, Professor Singh. That was an amazing, very, very, uh, very detailed answer to a lot of very interesting questions. So I very much appreciate that. Um, I think I, I had a question that kind of bounces off a of scene in Samina's question here. Uh, so there are lots of parallel topics that are running through strategy. And I was curious if you have seen topics that are fruitful for synergies, but they haven't spoken to each other, uh, but they should. And I think you have touched upon some of those already with Anita's right. previous question. Uh, so any thoughts about that? Thank right. You. And actually, I think Tim and Samina are, and Anita are very well positioned for this one. Uh, but let me try. I, I think... Um, it's a very good question. I think the um, we're really trying to uh, sort of parse the synergies into different um, sources, right? Uh, whether they're asset-based or knowledge-based uh, or somehow organizationally dependent, operationally dependent. I think that's an important decomposition that needs to happen. Um, a second issue related to that is I would propose a hypothesis that firms vary in their ability to access synergies. And that ability to access synergies will be dependent in part on the, uh, the category of synergy. And particularly if there's high interdependence situations versus pure asset specificity situations, uh, I think that's that's sort of a domain where one can look at the what synergies have better average, uh, you know, access, and what synergies have lower higher average access but higher variance. Uh, I think that would be something to think about. Um, and and then the other point there would be uh, really to to uh, also think about, and I keep coming back to the idea of capability is there a repeatable process to access synergy? And if you don't have a repeatable process, then your mean value will be low. Your mean appropriation level, hypothesis, mean appropriation level will be low. Okay. But this is definitely worth pursuing as a question. I know you guys, Tim and uh, Samina and other, and Anita, you have many others, Asim, have, have ways to deal with this. Yeah, yeah we do, but... Uh... You're the focus this time, Kabir. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it would be nice to hear a little bit more about, uh, and we've heard quite a bit about you, the person. So I, I didn't forewarn you that, about this question, but, but can you talk a little bit about what drives you? I mean, you, you, you're obviously successful. I mean, you look at the, the number of publications, the number of Google citations, the awards that you get, the, the students that you've nurtured, um, what drives you? What what uh, you know? What makes what makes you successful? Well, I uh, there are many places I have failed, and I think that's true for all of us. So, and, and I'm sorry. Well, I, I should also I should also note what I wanted to highlight was that you do it all. You're not just productive. You do it all with tremendous grace and humility, and. Uh, those are just beautiful qualities. And, so nice. and, uh, how, do you, how do you do it? That's so nice of you to say. Uh, no, I think, first of all, one has to, I mean, quite honestly, one has to confront one's failures, and that's one way in which you can get better. So I mean that seriously. 
actually I learned that uh, when I was playing tennis and getting beaten a lot. <laughs> I realized I'm not going to get better. Um, but, you know, I think that's something to think about. Uh, I think the, um, the, what, I think, you know, to me, what's fascinating, and I was thinking about that when we, in thinking about this conversation, I ran into one of my friends who was with me in undergrad. He was saying, you were a double E engineer. You were, you were good at that stuff. And you know, you're a professor and you know, um, how did you make that transition? And do you like this stuff? And I said, you know, actually the best thing that happened to me was to do a PhD in strategy. Uh, it was the best thing that happened to me. Um, and it was a perfect fit um, because I love the complexity of the questions. I love that you don't have a closed form solution. The answer is two or something like that. Uh, I also love the, the, the stakes are high in these questions. Um, and it's, it's inherently interesting. It's always interesting. Like today we're talking about coronavirus and how various companies will succeed. And this company, Pinduoduo, Duo, which I've not even heard of in Shanghai, made $35 billion in market cap in the last, you know, three months. It's insane. You know, so, so there's just this thing constantly bringing in new questions. Um, I learned a lot, by the way, from my co-authors, including people like Asim, my students from other co-authors. I also learned a lot in my field work on the <clears throat> India and China leaders study. And I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, I wanted to, I was doing statistical work all the time and it so happened that Peter Capelli, my, one of the co-authors on the India study came to me and said, he's an HR expert. He's very, very well known. <clears throat> and he said there were, wanted to study Indian uh, HR practices in India and uh, he had access to a company that uh, an organization that will get us lots of interviews. So we interviewed a hundred CEOs uh, through this organization. And I learned a lot about the things that we read about in, you know, Ansoff and Andrews and all these books, you know, Chandler um, and the more recent ones, of course, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, several of them. And, and I realized that, that for me, just taking advantage of interview opportunities, all of us know business leaders and maybe somebody running a medium sized business, uh, you know, you'll be surprised how much you can learn. So I love the triangulation of the phenomenon with theory and method. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I remain very focused on the questions because I can't, you can't boil the ocean. So my questions are typically quite narrow. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Okay, uh, Asim uh, has a few questions he'd like to ask you. Oh, um, Javier, since we were talking about uh, co-authors, and uh, I mean, I know it's weird for me to be asking you a question about co-authors, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, so um, I think especially early in your career, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, some of your most, uh, you know, seminal work was done with co-authors like Bruce Kogard, with Jeff Dyer, right, who were, kind of, you know, so, so I, 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 you know, at that stage in your career, how were you thinking about finding co-authors, identifying co-authors, who, who to work with, et cetera? Right. So, you know, a very good question, actually. So, um, Ned Bowman played, played a big role, by the way, uh, who was a professor of, actually, his, he moved from operational research into strategy. And he had this idea that the Jones Center, which he was running, was about the concerns of the CEO. And he would arbitrarily decide what's a concern and what's not a concern. He did, he did constant field work. And... Um, Bruce and I were young assistant professors and he was interested in foreign direct investment. Uh, and so I'm just trying to answer your question as to how we got into that. And uh, we, we found this cross-cultural measure and said, you know, it might be interesting to see cultural differences because Japan is seen as alliance-based and, you know, US is seen as acquisition-based. So we formulated a model with, you know, multinomial logit, uh, statistically strong, and the results were very strong. And then we said, let's write it up and, and we'll put the cultural stuff in there. And we got a lot of heat. I mean, you're, you're not cultural scholars. You have an index of culture. Who the hell are you? You, don't, you can't distinguish culture from your elbow, you know? 
So, um, but, you know, I think the idea was, this is Ned Bowman's uh, influence, that you just in a, almost a management science way, you pick a good question and try to answer it the best you can. And I think that was, and the co-authors, you know, uh, we, we just, we were too, too naive to be fearful. And so we did those projects. I think they were kind of low probability projects actually. But I think it's better not to just think about what journal you accepted. Yeah, but but how did you how do you choose your co-authors, particularly earlier in your career? Now you have a bunch of junior yeah. colleagues or, or or former students. Uh, I think the academy was a great place. You know, meeting people, chatting about stuff. Uh -huh. uh, you know, um, I remember we on on this whole issue about corporate versus business unit effects. Um, I ended up working with Sejin Chang on this, but it was my former student, but we, I was sitting in a, in, in a, I don't know, after midnight somewhere and um, arguing with Phil Bromley about, you know, and Anita, Anita did this work with Michael Porter on that and had the industry effect, which is great. Um, so uh, that the industry effect matters. But the idea was that, you know, uh, it can't be that the corporate effect is so low. It just cannot be because people would have found out about it long ago. You know, there's no explanation as to why the corporate effect is so low and nobody knows about it other than this regression model. So I think you kind of, uh, these stray conversations take you a long way. And so Phil decided at that conversation that he'll try to create some simulated data and run that and run new simulations where the data was always limited. So I'm just trying to suggest how this, these chance conversations, which I know all of us have, right. how that takes us forward. Yeah, yeah, and one of my co colleagues at Purdue, Tom Brush, worked with Phil on that exactly. project that you mentioned. Yeah. And, yes. and uh, yeah, that was, that's an important stream of work, actually. No, Tom was there, I remember we, we had this conversation. And so it's really about just, you yeah, know, I, I think I'm one of uh, probably many people to nominate that, that uh, McGann and Porter paper for the SMS yes. award that, uh, that they were. Anyway, yeah. um, and there I are- a, I was a discussant on that paper at a conference uh, when yeah. it was a working paper, so I loved it. it was I actually yeah. used that paper to, to teach my MBA. Like, you know, I say, oh, there's, there's, look, there's a 4% effect by the corporation. How do we explain that? You know, right. there's a couple of hypotheses. We yeah. shouldn't be teaching corporate strategy as one of them, you know. Uh, but it's higher than 2%, these are from Melbourne, zero to two. So it is. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Right. Uh, no, there's a good, there's a good follow on there. But uh, let's see, um, Nina has a question she'd like to ask. Asim, did you get all your questions in? Yeah, go ahead. I think, I think so. Nina, go ahead. Hi, Javier. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. Um, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is, uh, you, you, were, you mentioned companies like Pindodua um, that have introduced um, new uh, business model innovations in emerging markets. Um, mm -hmm. What are your views on studies that focus on uh, emerging market um, issues and the issue of generalizability um, now in the strategy field? Right. And secondly, um, I, as a early stage uh, PhD student, um, I'm at LBS. Uh, what advice do you have for us to be a good mentee uh, to our advisors and make the most out of it, uh, out of the experience? Uh, since you've had so many uh, wonderful PhD students you've mentored. So I'll ask Asim to answer that question because he was one of the mentees, and uh, I'll I'll after that I'll give my my suppositions on that. Uh, but you know your first question is really important. Um, you know, um, you have to look 30 years out, and I think these questions about what are emerging markets today uh, are already, many of them are established markets. And so I think um, it's good to, it's good to, if you have access to good data and so on, it's good to pursue those, but be realistic about Maybe there are different outlets uh, for that work, but in the it, it will actually have legs. Uh, I honestly did not expect that the foreign direct investment study we did would have the impact it did. I just thought it was, you know, the result was extremely strong statistically, and and I said, well, it is so strong that we have to write it up. Um, so sometimes, you know, you 
you just do it because it's important. I mean, what Tim did on the options in biotech, right? I mean, that was not an easy study to do, but it had legs, you know. So, so those are some of the things. Um, and I think there are some great stories out of China in this book that we did on the fortune makers. Uh, I was lucky enough to interview uh, Jack Ma, and um, and he was an English teacher, as many of you know. And he had read all the books on management. He had read the biographies of Jack Welch and others. And, you know, he was, he was very uh, much an absorber of different models. And then he implemented, uh, Alibaba still was a big innovation in many, many ways. Uh, but that Alibaba story is not unlike many other, you know, billionaire uh, or, or what do you call them, uh, unicorn stories, except that they became it could continue to be unicorns for a long time. Um, uh, and, and so I think um, if you look 30, if you look the next 10, 15 years, the major economies around the world are going to be major, major players. And so we can't be US centric with our questions and our data. I don't think we can be, uh, but, but yes, the, the data standards are higher and, Sometimes uh, a single country study might be a way to go. You know, uh, you anchor in a particular country, but you're very rigorous. When you go across countries, you lose some traction in terms of research design. And I'll ask Asim to answer the question <laughs> about being a mentee. Oh boy, I'm not sure I'm, 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 I'm not sure I was the best mentee, but anyway. Um... <laughs> I, I, I think I think you're um, pretty good. So let's start with that. I, I think um, uh, so. I, I guess the thing I will say most, and and maybe this only works with Khabir, but uh, I, I I think I think it's putting in it's it's doing the work before you actually talk to people and not being at the same time not being afraid to be wrong, mm. right? So I think you know there's a temptation to try to get it right. Uh, or, you know, just kind of wait until the mentor tells you what to do and then just kind of hold off. And I mean, as Javi already alluded to, that's certainly not how, how our relationship worked, right? Mostly I would write a whole paper and then Javi would sit there and say, but that's so uninteresting and that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you study this completely different thing? And then I'd say like, oh, right, you're right about this. And then I go away and kind of do it all over again, right? But I mean, I, I think I in our conversations, I was wrong more than I was right, but I think at the end of the day, I learned a lot more being wrong uh, a lot of the time because it really helped me to figure out how to get it right eventually. Uh, but, but I'm going to let Habib, you know, talk well, about what he accurate. thinks. No, I think that's very accurate. I think, and uh, Asim, you were different in the sense you wrote uh, substantial portions of text, uh, which was just your style, and that, that was fast <laughs> moving, and that was good. But I think um, otherwise, I think coming in with an outline and saying, this is what I plan to do, a detailed outline, you know, then let's see what we can do here or there. Um, and also being, being um, I don't think Asim and I disagreed much, but sometimes you have to realize your advisor may be wrong because, you know, you, it's an innovative business. You're the next generation. So, you know, you have to, you have to also, and I think what I would say there is, triangulate different advisors and you can get a lot from that. And, and I'll make one last point there, which is actually quite important. Um, uh, it took me, I realized early in my career when I was doing the thesis stuff, I realized that I need to improve my listening skills. You know, I thought it was about getting the answer and showing up. And uh, I realized that I really have to listen and I have to, you know, um, understand what, they are, what people are saying because people will couch it, you know, when they say, I'm not sure about this, what they're really saying is, you know, this is not very good at all, you know, so you have to kind of recognize that. And I say that because I've seen some students who are excellent at taking feedback. And I think that's, so that's a skill and, and you may be excellent. I don't know where you are on the spectrum. I was very poor at taking feedback and I worked towards getting better at it. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's painful. Just, just, uh, uh emphasize one of the things that I, I think you were saying is in terms of a good quality for a mentee is initiative. Uh, one of the things Asim did was take initiative. Absolutely. He didn't wait for you to tell him what, what the good idea was. He, he, uh, right. he gave you something to react to. Absolutely. Uh, That's right. 
That's right. That's there right. was probably much more to that, but that was one of the things that I heard. Uh, Samina, um, you have a question. Ramir, I was wondering um, if you have any advice for junior scholars about productivity or managing their pipeline as they're dealing with their tenure clock. Uh, absolutely, that's a good question. Um, I was on a panel, I remember, in one of the junior faculty workshops, and somebody asked, how many projects are you, do you have um, live at the moment? Uh, and I think they asked me, and I said, five or something like that. And one of the other panelists said, I, have, I do one at a time. Until I finish one, I don't start another one. So I realized there's no, there's no good answer to this question, uh, to, to that question. But speaking to what you were saying, um, I used to have a lot of anxiety, you know, getting up in the middle of the night and saying, my God, you know, uh, this is just not working. Um, but uh, I had a portfolio approach and uh, that kind of helped me quite a bit. Um, and I think the, looking back, I made some mistakes and one of them was not letting go on some projects. And that's one advice I would give is, you know, you may be in love with the project and the idea, but you have to let it go if it's just not working. And uh, put your money on, put your effort on the ideas that are more likely to see the light of day in the early stages. Yeah, I've heard, uh, I've heard other people say this too, that, that one of the biggest time savers they have is abandoning projects. Right. And I think that there's an interesting managerial lesson here, but, but also from the perspective of an academic, it's hard to stop project. So how, how do you do that, Harbier? How do you, how do you finish a project off, particularly when you have co-authors that yeah. you're working with? Well, I think we, it's a consensus decision. So the co-author also may say, hey, you know, typically I have more than one. I mean, there's a couple of papers that are related, but that's a good point. Sometimes... Um, it's your co-author's decision whether they'll pursue or not, but we've typically had a consensus around it. And as I mentioned, I've not been very good at it myself, but I think exit is important. And I know I say that because people who are really productive who produce a paper every you know X number of months over a multiple years, that's what they do. They're very good at managing the pipeline. I'll say one more thing, Samina, that's really important. Never take the reviews personally. I, I think the, I talked to Bob Haskis and who was super productive when I was in the younger state and I was very annoyed with the particular review. It was on a paper on alliances. And I was saying, I don't, let me talk to Bob. And he says, uh, I said, oh, this guy is asking me to go back and check on this thing in the field and I, what is this and all that, he's wrong. And he said, why are you taking it personally? I mean, he read the paper, this is what he's asking. You can wait six months, he'll still ask the same question. So why don't you go and do it, you know? So the notion of um, not taking, in other words, when you start a revision, you have to keep, take your emotion out of it. And you have to understand that people are reading the document and responding. They're not, they don't know what's on your mind. And that's hard. And even today I get irritated with uh, reviews I receive. So it, I think this is just me, personality wise. Okay. Okay, great. Um, uh, Samina, I think it's probably reasonable for me to turn it over to you. I think you want to take a photo before we ask the fun questions. That would be great. So if, if folks are comfortable showing their videos, then that would be wonderful. We'll take a screenshot so we can post this to our Twitter feed and all the other fun things that we do online, We're trying to be innovative and hip. All right, so maybe I'll count to three. So if everyone can look at their screen and smile, all right, one, two, three, cheese. All right, I think I got a good photo. Thank good. you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Yeah. Um, before the fun questions, I have one more serious question, Harvey, because you mentioned this publication process. Can you give us an example of earlier in your career, or it might be recent too, a challenge you had with a paper or project with reviewers in the publication process? Because I think as junior faculty, you know, I'm sure, you know, we see you as successful, everything seemed to go right, you know, 50,000 citations. Can you give us a specific example? So I still remember a paper that I, you know, um, two papers I abandoned. One was about, um, which I should have pursued actually, but it just so hard I didn't pursue it. But it was a notion of, uh, 
you know, when you have multiple bidders on a particular transaction, this is very early, so I was doing very much m a kind of thing. Uh, what I found was that in unrelated transactions, the exposure to the uh, winner's curse was higher than in related transactions. And it sort of seems obvious, but it's not obvious because the related transaction also, you could have two very interested buyers who run it up. And so it's not at all obvious. And I wrote the working paper, I sent it to, I think SMJ and the reviewers just said, ah, you know, we, we don't, you know, you've got to do a better modeling, this and that. Um, some guy from the law school at Penn picked it up and began referring to it and was using it and said, when is it coming out? And I told him I'm not pursuing it because I can't solve this research design question. So that was one. Another one on hostile takeovers, which I abandoned was, uh, also something that could have been a good angle, but I just didn't pursue it because reviewers were not, were asking me to climb a very high hill and I couldn't see myself doing that. And that was about uh, that people are more likely to engage in, it was prospect theory. People engage in hostile takeovers more often when their core business is really hurting. And I was trying to give this prospect theory angle that it's not about being hostile and being anti-management and so on. And it was just very hard to unpack the other theories. And so I just dropped it. And I think that was the right decision because I would have spent a lot of time and it would not have got published. Especially when we're under a time crunch, right? So maybe something you could pursue later, but not as a junior faculty member. No, no it, was just, it was just too hard. And I just, right. yeah. So now I get to ask you some fun questions, I think. Um, and Tim and Asim, you know, as kind of, Hosts, co-hosts, feel free to jump in if you think of some fun ones too. Okay. But I'll start with some easy ones. So these are ones I've, I've asked everyone is, what is your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert is pistachio ice cream. Mm. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one, but that's good. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you've probably traveled the world. What are What is your favorite city? Do you have one? I'll name two because for different reasons. One is London, which is kind of obvious because you know it's a cosmopolitan place, great food and so on. Another one is Rangoon or Yangon in Burma. Um, and it was really a throwback to 30 years before in terms of the feel of the city and the very, very old culture. Uh, and you know, just, just uh, you know, beautiful temples, uh, a lot of stress below the surface, but very, very interesting. Okay, I hope to go there one day. Um, all right, do you read fiction or nonfiction when you're not reading strategy scholarship? I read uh, mostly fiction, good literature, I think. I try to read good literature if I can. What counts as good literature? Well, good, good literature as in not pulp fiction so much, although there are times when you just want to, you know, uh, not concentrate a whole lot, but I would say, you know, things like, you know, George Orwell, you know, people like that, you know, so I enjoy, uh, I mean, one of my favorite books is uh, Down and Out in London and Paris by George Orwell. Uh, so yeah, things like that. If you had to choose between living in the mountains or by the ocean, which would you choose and why? I would live in the mountains. Um, I love the, you know, the heights and the, you know, evergreens typically are there. If not, you still have vistas. I'm not as much of a beach person, you know, so, but I, I can understand why people like the ocean. Here's a random one. If you were given a free car and you had to choose between a sports car or a pickup truck, which would you choose? I would choose a sports car, not a pickup truck. Um, I would probably not choose either, but if <laughs> <laughs> although I must say, I must say that I have typically bought the higher horsepower versions of even uh, relatively boring cars. So I, I want the- You still uh, want the horsepower. I, yeah. I, should mention, I should mention that I used to ride a motorcycle when I was younger and I've been, and my wife has uh, put a, complete ban on that. Uh, so I love the wind in my face and my hair and all that, you know, I know that's a different <laughs> side of me. 
<laughs> Very cool. Um, That's great. Yeah. So speaking of wives, this is this is a this is a personal one, Herbier. What right. would your wife say is your worst and best quality? Uh, my worst quality is inability to notice uh, things lying on the ground. You know, that's my worst quality. Uh, best quality, I think, is I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure what she'll say, but uh, what I think she'll say is that. Um, you know, I choose not to argue back at times. You know, I just, I, I tend to swallow my thoughts. And I think I'm a decent listener. I'm, I'm a reasonably good listener. But I can't see things on the ground. Mm -hmm. Could you tell my husband that one about choosing when not to argue back? That would be really helpful. <laughs> uh, all right. If, so no, I'll say one more thing. I used to, when I used to play squash, I used to often, when it accumulated, I used to go and play squash by myself and hit the ball against the wall. So that was great. You know, so there's, you need an outlet of some sort. But And so speaking of squash, so what, what do you do to unwind or to relax? So you mentioned squash and tennis, I think. In, in yeah, I played, a lot of, I played a lot of tennis. I, I think I was not good at it, but then I played a long time and eventually the people I played with were worse than me. So it was good. My game remained <laughs> where it was, more or less. Uh, lately, I've taken to golf, which I know is incredibly boring. Um, and so I only play when I have some time. But it's very nice. It's very nice to get out. And, and particularly now in the coronavirus, there's not much else we can do. So you can at least walk around a bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Last, last question here. Oh, go ahead, Asim. You should follow up and ask him who he plays golf with. <laughs> Who, who do you play golf with, Sergey? You know, Heer and I play when we're at various conferences, you know. Ah, okay. We've been recited, we've been recited on the golf course, you know, so. <laughs> Got it. Um, and and other inside information too, so. Yeah, Asim has insider information there. <laughs> um, and and Harbir, if last question, if you could have dinner and conversation with any kind of deceased historical figure, who would it be and why? Deceased historical figure. That's an interesting one. Let me think about it. I would say Thomas Edison. Mm. You know, I mean, it's just uh, remarkable how he managed to invent so many things. But I'll give you another one. Lewis Carroll, who wrote, you know, all these great uh, Alice in Wonderland and so on. Although that was a pseudonym. I don't know what the real name was, but... Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you Great. so thank you so much on behalf of the division, Herbert. Thank I'm you. Thank you. Turn it over it's to Tim. Honor and a privilege. The pleasure is mine, and thank no, you. we're so uh, honored to have you here, and uh, thank you for your contribution today, and most importantly, your contribution uh, throughout your career. You've left a huge imprint on the field, and and uh, not just in your productivity, but in your demeanor and and how you carry yourself and for people uh, like me that come along and want to understand what a, what a good, inquisitive, uh, humble academic is, I look to people like you and you're a tremendous embodiment of that, Harbir. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. I'm deeply touched. Thank you. Yep. And of course, many of you guys have the same attributes, so we are in a mutual admiration society here, I think. So when, thanks to all for coming. Anita, thank you for your, and all the questions that people gave. Okay, let's thanks. end it here. And uh, thanks so much for everybody attending and great thanks. session. Thanks, yep. thanks. Enjoyed Bye -bye. it. See everyone tomorrow, hopefully, for Anita's interview. All yeah. right, have a great love, night. I love the fun questions too. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad. Okay. All right. Have a so great much. day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.